Welcome to the Ancestral Mind. I'm your host, Colin Stegger, founder and CEO of Wild Foods Co. and the AncestralMind.com. And if you're coming to us from Spotify, Google, or Apple on your favorite podcast app, thanks for listening there. And if you're watching me on YouTube, you can just type in the AncestralMind.com or type in Colin Stuckert and the channel will pop up. I'm going to do my best to look at the camera, even though this is really a podcast. I'm trying to do this multiple uh, format option where I can really kill two birds with one stone, get a good YouTube video and get the podcast. Today's all about the carnivore-based diet and then something more specifically within that, what's the deal with produce? Because this is something I've been talking about for a while and I think there's not enough awareness around it and I think people almost kind of gloss over when I say these things to them because it's almost like too advanced and too beyond their understanding to even allow it into their brain. So I want to spend some time talking about how produce today in the typical supermarket, even locally from your farmers to an extent, is not the same produce that our biology might be used to. And we're going to unpack why that is, what I mean by that. We're going to talk about like hybridization. And we're not really going to geek out on this. I'm going to kind of keep it very general and broad because I want you and everyone to be thinking about the produce that they're that you're buying and consuming and eating and how in some cases it might not be that great for you. It could even be bad for you if you have certain sensitivities to certain things that you can find in produce. And we'll keep it try to around that surface level, right? Not too deep. Before we get into that though, what's the deal with the carnivore diet? Like, why am I talking about that? Why is that becoming a thing right now? And this has all been happenstance for me. I didn't plan to do this. I wasn't even particularly drawn to it other than I thought there was some merit to it. But then when I started really thinking about it more closely and when I started tracking what I was eating and what my body was leaning me to want to eat, like what I was craving and what I enjoyed more when I did eat and the fact that it happened to be something looking like a carnivore-based diet, uh, I started to really open my mind and started thinking about this a lot more closely. And now to the point where I am doing mostly carnivore-based diet, I do have dairy here and there, I do have some greens here and there, and I do have sweet potatoes and yams and things like that, but it's very keto, it's very low carb, and it's only an accompaniment to the animal products that I'm eating right now. So I want to talk about a couple of the benefits that I've, that I've, so I want to talk about a couple of the benefits from that that I've experienced, and you can all obviously listen to the other shows on The Ancestral Mind. We had Michaela Peterson on recently, and then we had Sean Baker, who's the primary doctor that's kind of at the forefront of the carnivore movement. We had him on actually a couple days ago. We also had another doctor on yesterday, uh, ex-Navy, uh, Ben Horn Walby, Hornby. We had a doctor on earlier today, actually, to talk about how he does kind of a zero carb, mostly carnivore based diet and how it's allowed him to basically cure his metabolic syndrome uh, that he had for over 30 plus years. So there's some really powerful stuff here, but even if you're not into this type of thing or you're maybe not even open to it, at the very least, you're gonna benefit from understanding your produce a little bit better, where it comes from, what the properties are, how some could be better than others, maybe even how organic it's not the end all be all that people think. I have a comment on that that we'll talk about. And I'm going to keep the show. And so I think there's going to be something here for everyone. So let's dive right into it by first talking about some of the benefits that I'm, I'm experiencing on the carnivore diet right now. Okay. So we've just moved out to uh, our 10 acre homestead just outside of Austin, Texas. And since I've been out here, we've been eating a lot more of our meals at home. Right, So there's definitely a variable there because I'm not eating at restaurants as much. But we've also been eating a very meat-based, carnivore-based diet, uh, almost completely keto. Like my carbs probably haven't dipped above 50 grams since we moved out here a month ago. And almost every meal, the centerpiece is a usually a steak or pork or chicken as, as the base, right? Although I do prefer red meat primarily or like salmon or something like that as the base. Uh, I don't do a lot of eggs, so I'm kind of sensitive to them, but, but that's going to be a personal choice. Some people do better with eggs than others. So what are the benefits I'm experiencing? Well, I've already leaned up quite a bit. I actually haven't weighed myself, but just looking in the mirror, I've leaned up quite a bit from the you know years of eating out and trying to balance health with my busy schedule as CEO and all these other things. I definitely put on a few pounds when I moved to Austin uh, or after I moved to Austin, I should say, and that was five years ago. And I definitely got to a point where I was still lean the way I am because I'm naturally lean, but I had a little bit too much fat in my midsection here than I prefer and then I had before. And I noticed turning 34 years old that my metabolism has definitely slowed down. And so even though I was eating out less than I was before and maybe I was eating a little bit too much sugar here and there, I 
was not able to kind of just burn it off or maintain it as much as I used to. So I had to actually dial down the amount of times I was eating out and the sugar I was eating on a regular basis. And I was still having trouble shedding off that, those fat pounds the way I might have been able to do when I was 25, 26, 27. Okay. So the one big benefit is I'm getting lean. I'm getting leaner. And even with, you know, being a pretty lean guy as it is getting really shredded up in the midsection area is obviously a huge benefit going keto with this. I mean, if you're doing carnivore, you're basically doing keto because, because a carnivore based diet is going to be mostly meat and you're have almost no carbs. And, and the really hardcore version of the carnivore diet, if you ask any of the experts that will kind of define it, they will say it's basically no carbs, right? My version and why I call it kind of a keto carnivore and a carnivore-ish diet is I like to do very low carb, but I'm still having some carbs here and there, very strategic carbs, whether that is a tuber, whether that is even white potatoes from time to time, uh, maybe even some white rice from time to time, and some vegetables here and there. Like Allison, my son, mom, they are all eating various salads or whatever. You know, It's just the way we've been eating for a while, whereas I'm just kind of taking a step back from that. But if we have it on the table, I'm going to eat it. And I think that's probably the way it is for most people. I don't have any severe autoimmune issues or any reasons why this is going to affect me very aggressively. So I don't really have to eliminate and go zero carb completely. I mean, I'm already getting to the point where I'm going to probably hit the lowest body fat percentage I've ever had in my life. And I'm going to probably have to pay attention to not make sure I'm losing too much weight because I also want to put on muscle mass, right? So I might have to balance out the amount of calories I'm eating, maybe the amount of fat I'm eating, et cetera. And I'll probably say within the next 30, 60 days, I'm going to probably be hitting that and then have to figure out like what does my maintenance look like right maybe i have to just maybe up my protein and fat intake eat two steaks every meal instead of one i don't know but we'll, we'll look at what that looks like in about 30 60 days and if you want to follow along with that progress definitely make sure you're subscribing to wherever you're finding this and also go check me out on instagram at colin stuckert at c-o-l-i-n-s-t-u-c-k-e-r-t so the other really big benefit that i'm noticing is i've had some kind of chronic back pain I've been dealing with for a couple of years now. And when I started to really pay attention to it and started to feel it, I would, I've done the chiropractor, I've done the hanging, uh, inversion table. I've done, I have these, these mats at night that are, are prongs that help you sleep and also help release endorphins to help with back pain. I've done like uh, foam rolling, uh, so as treatment to everything you can think of really, I've almost done everything. And it would kind of be better sometimes, worse sometimes. I noticed that uh, ever since I started deadlifting as much, it's actually come on. And I think there's actually a correlation there to when I stopped lifting as much, squatting and deadlifting, and, and I kind of dialed back my weightlifting, I noticed that the back pain came on. So I think there's definitely a correlation there. But what I'm also th realizing is probably one of the big reasons that I don't have back pain right now is because I'm not eating out as much. So I'm not having gluten slip into my diet as it probably was, right? Even if I'm eating gluten-free at a restaurant, you're almost going to always get it from cross-contamination. And what I also think is going on here is I'm not having those inflammatory, let's say nut and seed oils, the gluten, and I'm eating much less vegetables, pretty sure that my gut is simply less bloated because there are some mechanisms in place that they've proven that if you, if your gut is expanding or you're bloated, uh, or if you even have to do take a bowel movement, for example, that th the way the pressure builds up, it can cause back pain and certain things to pinch and maybe a nerve to pinch or whatever, because your body's basically swelling from the inside. Right. And that can cause back pain for some people. So I think there's definitely something going on there where I'm probably less swollen and, and bloated from the inside. And as a result, it's putting less pressure on the certain parts of my body. And I have interior pelvic tilt. I have something my whole life where the pelvis tilts up and the gut kind of leans forward. And it's just, you know, and sitting for years does not help with that by any means. And so I think a combination of those two things, not eating out, but also eating probably not many of the foods that were inflaming me and inflaming my gut before. And so that's one of the huge benefits of the carnivore diet is you get rid of all that crap. Now, yeah, you need to be cooking at home, but we all should be doing that anyways because eating at restaurants is not a sustainable long-term option. Really crappy products and the cross-contamination. There's just a lot of things wrong with restaurant food. I don't, I'm not gonna get into that right now. I wanna talk about produce though. So there's a couple of the benefits. Getting leaner, back pain's going, you know, energy, all the other benefits that you get from just eating better. I mean, I, I have them all. Like, it's just amazing, right? But I'm going to give a shout out to the book I just bought that is actually I'm going to kind of use as a reference for the this next section. So this is the Carnivore Cookbook by Maria Emmerich and Craig Emmerich. These are two keto kind of cookbook authors. They have a lot of, I, I think they're pretty popular in keto space. I've never heard the of them until I found this book and this book's amazing and I'm going to try to get them on the show actually. So keep an eye out for that. So they have a section here on page 19, the case against produce. And 
I mean, I just, I love this book because it really simplifies a lot of these big ideas for a carnivore and, and even a, you know, keto because carnivore is keto, but depending on how, what your flavor of keto is, this is carnivore based, but you get a lot of the same benefits from doing a keto diet, but we'll talk about that on another show. I'm going to probably not read word for word. I'm going to skim through some of these, but they, they basically talk about how hybridization and crossbreeding has made it so that the produce available today that modern humans are eating are a far cry from the foods that our ancestors may have eaten. And I agree with this wholeheartedly. I've talked about this a lot before. This gives me some exact concrete examples that I can use to expand on that, okay? We talk about how, you know, modern produce looks nothing like what our ancestors ate, and that's verbatim from the book. Our ancestors had access to these fruits and vegetables only in the summer months and most, most climates. That's a really big one we talk about in the sexual mind as well, variability. Most of us don't cycle the foods we're eating, and one of the only foods that would have been available year-round would have been animal products, right? Certain greens, certain fruits, certain things in nature, in the plant kingdom particularly, are not always available year-round, and furthermore, a lot of them are not always available at certain uh, areas in certain geographic locations, and there's certain mixed variability in these types of foods. So like the idea that our ancestors might have lived off of a plant-based diet, it's just, astro it's just it's, it's asinine, really. At this point, I feel like that's been resolved. Like that's not even a thing we have to think about. But of course you have people in like the vegan propaganda movements where they try to flip that, right? And try to suggest that plants are the best thing for humans or whatever. Again, I'm not going to get into carnivore and why that's not the case. I want to talk about just about produce today. Keep this show nice and short and sweet. So the big thing about produce is modern produce looks nothing like what our ancestors ate. We've actually hybridized and bred which is a form of human intervention to make produce do what we want it to do. And if you look at any of the food companies and even the produce industry, what are they trying to do? They're trying to make food that looks like it tastes good. It's going to have to ship well, and it's going to have to stay good on the shelf for as long as possible. Then they want consumers to really enjoy it. So they're going to try to increase the sugar content and keep coming back for more. The first example they use is a wild watermelon and they compare it to a modern watermelon. This wild watermelon had an extremely bitter taste. They say they were about 80% water, 1.9% sugar, and 18% starch and fat. In fact, think about it today. Like modern, there's no fat in watermelons today. Like that's weird. I wondered that what that would even have been. So the modern watermelon, for example, measures 26 inches across, which is about 10 times bigger. It's very sweet and juicy, which we all know. I mean, watermelon is delicious, I will say. There's over 1,200 varieties grown year round. The percentages are about 90% water, so it's 14 times juicier, 6% sugar, so it's 3.3 times as sweet, and only 2% other ingredients compared to the 18 with almost no starch or fat included. That's, that's a pretty big difference. Wow. Uh, okay, wild banana. Here's a really good one. So bananas were cultivated 7,000 years ago in what is now Papua New Guinea. Now we have them all over the world, of course. And they were, they were probably closer to like a thick plantain but they have these large, tough seeds on the inside that I don't think you could eat. And then it even says here that most of the flesh was inedible, which is weird that we decided to, to, to breed that. Today, bananas are seedless, three times longer, and over 21% sugar. <laughs> it's just crazy when we look at this stuff. Uh, modern carrot used to be very thin, uh, distinct and powerful flavor. Uh, it was by Ninio plant. The modern carrot is a result of years of manipulating mutant strands of purple carrots through experimentation done by the Dutch in the 16th century. And I'm sure it's sweeter than the wild variety. Wild corn. Here's another one. That's a good one. So corn was actually cultivated from something called teosinte, and it was barely edible and as dry as a potato. It had very hard kernels. You needed a hammer or a sharp object to even peel it. And it was about 75% water, 1.9% sugar, and 23% other, mostly starch. Modern corn, on the other hand is uh, there's about 200 varieties today grown, 800 million tons per year is produced, and it is very sweet and juicy and made up of 73% water, 6% sugar, which is 3.5 times sweeter, and 20% other, mostly starch. And the thing about corn is it does not reproduce on its own. Like It, it requires human inter intervention or all the corn on the planet would just die out, which is pretty telling, right? <laughs> because that doesn't happen in the wild. Wild peach. Measured less than one inch across. Can you imagine that? So that's one inch. That's that's this. It's like it's like a quarter, size of a quarter almost. About 30% of the fruit was a pit. So nearly half was a pit and only 64% was edible. The peach tasted earthy with a sweet, sour, and salty flavor. Wow, that's interesting. Salty. Almost like a lentil. It was 71% water, 8% sugar, and 20% other. 
The modern peach is about four inches across, 67 times larger in volume. And the stone comprises only 10% of the fruit, leaving 90% edible. It is very sweet and juicy. It is 89% water, 8.4% sugar, which is four times sweeter by volume, and 1% other. Okay, there's two more, and then we're going to wrap this up and maybe talk about a couple other things, uh, examples before we close out. Okay, wild strawberries were very small at less than a quarter inch across. They were sweet and tart. So these were real, like those really small berries. It would take a day of foraging to collect a handful. That's another really important thing. It's this idea that our ancestors could have gone in the wild and eaten all those fruit and vegetables, but the amount of energy you have to expend to process them, to find them, to work. I mean, it's crazy. Even today, modern produce, the amount of labor that goes into getting that kind of amount of calories, like it's insane. No human ancestor would have done that. We'd have died off a long time ago if that was our strategy. So the strawberry was first hybridized by French botanists in the 1300s. Uh, they managed to make a fruit 15 to 20 times larger. So strawberries are now grown year round, over 9 million tons produced a year. And it doesn't say here about the sweetness, but I have seen modern strawberries compared to wild strawberries. And I think wild strawberries might actually be sweeter, but they were so much smaller. And so modern strawberries today are big, so they can sell you by the pound, right? But there's a lot of white flesh and they're not that tasty. So this is one of those ones that they would have been sweeter and better in the wild, but we wouldn't have eaten a lot of them. Final one to wrap up this section for produce is the wild tomato. So the tomato originated in Peru and was a small, almost berry-like fruit that measured about one third across. The modern tomato is hundreds of times bigger than its wild ancestor at four inches across. It was hybridized in Mexico and was introduced to Europe in the 16th century. It didn't become popular in America until 1840s, and now there's over 160 million tons a year produced. I mean, most tomatoes don't taste that great, but the ones that do are going to be done as organic as possible by small farmers. And I do like tomatoes, but for some people, it being a nightshade, it can really mess you up. If you have any gut issues related to tomatoes, try peeling them and then cooking them, and you might do okay talks about most of produce that is eaten today, right? And these foods are, you know, widely considered as healthy or ideal or the best foods for humans. And really, the, it's just not the case. You know, I, I look at vegetables now and fruits now as a treat added to a diet, diet that is mostly carnivorous. And if you look at all the research, and obviously, and this book covers it well, guys, so check it out on Amazon. I highly recommend it. If you look at what makes the natural, most optimal, most obvious human diet, it is a carnivore based diet it just is right and there is so much evidence to point to this and you can listen to all the success stories of people around the world and the carnivore movement is picking up a lot of steam and i'm really glad it is because at the very least it's going to help people move to more of a low carb high fat based diet which is the most ideal way for humans to eat okay so that's going to cover today's short short show Make sure that you like and subscribe in all those places. If you want to reach out to me and you have any questions or comments on any of this stuff or anything you want us to cover in the future, send it over to Colin at wildfoods.co. And if this is coming to you on iTunes or Spotify or Google or any of those places that you can leave a review, please leave a review. It's going to help us tremendously reach other people with this very, very important information that is going to help people get off the standard American diet, get off the drugs and the pharmaceutical companies, help change the food industry that is desperately in need of change, and help support small farmers doing things the right way, respecting animals, respecting our environment, and feeding people in a way that is sustainable long-term and that is better for everyone, the end consumer and the animals and the environment. And so please help me spread this message and help me spread and reach more people as much as possible. And so a review or a share, of course, that helps as well. And we really, really appreciate that. And that's going to be it for today. So I'll see you in the next one.